I'd like to start with a little bit of a settling moment here. If you will all do this along with me, we're going to inhale while I count five. Exhale while I count seven. Here we go. In five. One, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We'll come back to that in a little bit. Um, is that fuzzy? It looks fuzzy to me. Is it all right? Huh. Uh, I, I'm honored to be presenting to colleagues in the field of Misphonia hypercusis tinnitus and um, some of the best in the world from my little corner of Misophonia world. And I have to start with a disclaimer. I'm not an audiologist and I'm not a researcher. And um, apparently I don't know how to spell either. Yeah, you have to try. <laughs> Uh, I, I'm, I am a psychotherapist. My name is Jillian Jaffe. I'm from the Los Angeles area, formerly a teacher, and I've been a clinician working with hundreds of <coughs> tinnitus and especially misophonia patients for several years. I came to this in a circuitous route. When I began working with tinnitus, uh, I developed a program that seemed effective in using CBT to treat tinnitus. And um, it, it is an, in an oversimplified version. <coughs> CBT combines your thoughts, your feelings, and your actions. And if you change one of them, I often do this with, with people and say, well, if you change one of them, the thoughts, let's say, it will cause the others to automatically be changed. And then we go on to talk about how that works. And so the, the, the premise is that it isn't the thing that's happening that determines how you feel. It's what you think about it or how you perceive it that makes the, the difference in how you feel. And you can change what, the way you think, and you'll end up feeling better and acting better, even if the situation remains the same. So when I got my first... Um, Oh, well, so with CBT working well with tinnitus, as has been talked about earlier in the, the master class, uh, six sessions, I do four to six sessions of tinnitus with CBT and manages it quite well. So when I got my first misophonia, mis misophonia patient, um, I thought, well, it makes sense to just transfer over and do that. And what I found was that it doesn't work as well with... Uh, misophonia, because these people have an extreme level of agitation, distress, anxiety, reactivity, emotional dysregulation, and CBT I did not find sufficient. So I began to develop a different version of what I was doing. I began to learn about DBT, which is Dialectical Behavior Therapy, and um, I actually had never wanted to learn this because it was designed to work with borderline personality disorders and I never wanted to work with those people at all. <laughs> but I found that the, the process was uh, helpful because um, it's intended to deal with extreme emotionality. Yeah. So what I've ended up doing is kind of a multi-dimensional approach with uh, CBT and DBT, and also uh, a lot of stories and a lot of metaphors and humor, and I've also recently added EMDR and EFT, which is tapping, if anybody knows about that, and these things have all been very helpful. See, it's not good for your studies because that's a combination of things. It doesn't isolate one, and you can't say this one works, and that's why. That's just, uh, as I said, I'm not the researcher, I'm the clinician. So the purpose of DBT is to decrease behaviors that interfere with life therapy or quality of life, this is what they say, and to increase emotion regulation, mindfulness, distress tolerance, and interpersonal effectiveness. And um, by definition, their premise is that for some reason, 
people who, who are, some people are prone to react more intensely to interpersonal relationship kinds of emotional situations, family, romantic, friends, work situations. And for whatever reason, these, these people, uh, their arousal level, they increase far more rapidly than other people. They reach higher level of emotional stimulation and they take much longer to return to a base level. Um, so DBT has a concept called radical acceptance. On the one hand, accepting on the one hand, accepting what is, and on the other hand, seeking change. So acceptance is very big, very important part. Change is the other very important part. So what I'm going to do today is give you some examples of strategies from each component of DBT, the acceptance skills and the change skills. And under acceptance, there is emotional regulation and mindfulness. And under change, there's distress tolerance and interpersonal effectiveness. So what we did at the beginning, that breathing thing, is an emotion regulation a DBT process called paced breath. When you inhale something and you exhale more than that, what it does is it changes the ratio of oxygen carbon dioxide in the brain and what that does is it shifts from the sympathetic to the parasympathetic nervous system beginning immediately. So it settles people very quickly. You can imagine that our ancestors were out there getting ready to go out and hunt dinner goes out into the forest, and behind a tree hears some noises, breathing, chewing, slobbering, whatever the sounds might be. His body would immediately go into fight or flight, survival mode, because his body instantly reacted as though he was in danger, which in fact he may very well have been. So he didn't know if this might be what was awaiting him. So either it was going to get him, or he was going to get it, or he was going to run away really quickly to get away from it. Um, so, if you think about what the common trigger sounds are for misophonia, it falls right in there. Chewing, breathing, sniffing, lip smacking, uh, anything that has to do with food, gum, um, Clicking, typing, I went through all the exhibit areas looking at their pens. I'm always looking at pens because people with misophonia often do not like click, click, click. It drives them crazy. So when we do the Misophonia Association Conference for patients and families every year, this is our sixth year coming up in October, we get pens that turn quietly. They do not click. Just fall. Uh, other things like flip-flops and plastic rustling, and so these things may be uh, reminiscent of the danger sounds from our evolutionary history. And when I present that to people in that context, it makes sense to them. I don't know if it's true, but I think it makes sense, and, and it does help people understand why this is happening to them and how they perhaps can come to manage it better if they understand that. Uh, this is a quote from Bessel van der Kolk. For real change to take place, the body needs to learn that the danger has passed and to live in the reality of the present. CBT is a top-down method. <coughs> it works cognitively, which is great, except that some things that are going on are not coming cognitively. They're coming from other parts of the brain and other parts of the system that are not logical and not cognitive. That's why it's difficult to apply it directly, and I think other things are helpful. So a second component besides uh, the, the one about um, emotion regulation, second acceptance skill is mindfulness. Uh, if I said to you, don't think of a pink elephant, okay? So when people say to their child or to an adult, well, just don't think about, don't pay attention to that sound, it does not help because they are paying attention to that sound by trying not to. So since we have selective attention, we can't think about everything at the same time, 
Uh, I help people learn how to move their mind and their thinking away from the things that bother them. We do this with objects, so they pick up an object, describe it in depth, put it down, pick up a different one. By the time they get to the third object and I say to them, are you thinking about the first object? No, they're not. So it's a way of beginning to get the concept that you can move away from something that's troublesome. Um, we do this with, with thoughts as well as with objects. And this leave the forest, if you're standing in the forest and you're surrounded by trees and then you leave the forest, what happens to the forest? Nothing. It's still there. The sounds are still there, but you have left, in a sense, metaphorically. Uh, and so I help people learn how to do that. Now, uh, mindfulness, uh, second piece of that is acceptance. Acceptance does not mean that you like it, you chose it, you created it, or that you're giving up. That's often what people think it means, and it's not. What it is, is acceptance of um, you acknowledge that it is what it is, that at least for now it's not going away, it's your problem, it's not the sound or that person over there, it's the way your brain is processing that sound, and that you're the person who has to find ways to live with it anyway which is a very tough place to start, but that is where I start. One of my favorite ways of explaining this is I tell the story from the movie A Beautiful Mind, came out several years ago. It's a true story of Professor John Nash, brilliant mathematician. Turned out he was schizophrenic. He was having hallucinations. They put him on all kinds of drugs, electric shock, trying to get his hallucinations to go away. Never went away. But what he did was he was able to push them out of his consciousness over to the side so that he could interact with the world that other people were perceiving. Every now and then they would pop back up and he would just kind of acknowledge that, oh, there they are, and he would shove them back over out of the way again. So I help people learn how to do that. Um, the point being that even if this problem that you really desperately want to have it go away, you want it to stop, it's not going to happen. Uh, you can deal with it anyway, even if it never goes away. So back to this concept of accepting what is, the other side is seeking change. And there are two areas here. One of them is distress tolerance. People with misophonia tend to be intolerant. They're perfectionistic, obsessive, highly anxious, driven, and extremely judgmental. So one of the areas that I work on to help people learn how to tolerate distress is I show them these pictures from, um, this is a Japanese pot, pottery called uh, kintsukurai. The process is repairing broken pottery with a gold or silver lacquer. And the piece is more beautiful for having been broken and repaired than it was when it was perfect. And we talk a lot about perfection. The beauty and appreciation of things that are imperfect, impermanent, imper and incomplete is called wabi-sabi in the Japanese culture. So this is an example of a Japanese garden where everything is absolutely perfect, except that then they go and they knock some rocks off, or they knock some leaves off of a tree. I had a, a, a handyman came to change the plates on my light switches, and he did every single one of them perfectly, Plum, perfectly aligned, except one that was just a little bit off. And I have just a little bit of this OCD-ishness in me. And I said to him, clearly you know how to make it straight, because all the rest of them are. Why did you do that? And he said, because only God is perfect. Okay. And so then I, I give a prescription to people where this uh, applies, to um, prescribe in to uh, imperfection. I ask them to choose something and intentionally do it wrong and live with it for a while. Go in your closet and hang the things in the wrong place because they tend to have everything. Sort of mix up one of the books, put one of the books back in a different place than where you always have it. Uh, take magnets on your refrigerator and all in a be beautiful, perfect alignment, tip one of them slightly and then tolerate it, stand it for a little while, and then you can put it back, but while, you can, while you're tolerating it, breathe, and remind yourself that the sky isn't falling, the world isn't ending, it's just a magnet. 
because they get very worked up about every little thing like that. Uh, another aspect of this change thing is interpersonal effectiveness. So DBT has a, um, an analysis, they call it a chain, and I've adapted their chain to look like this. And I find this actually very useful. This is your vulnerability. You have a vulnerability to certain sounds. A trigger comes in, and you immediately have this reaction. You go straight this way to a blow up, a meltdown, something like that. Uh, it's the knee-jerk reaction. The doctor hits your knee and your foot pops up. You can't help it, you just immediately go there. And what would be more useful would be if you could go this way and have a response. Now, in order to do that, you have to be able to pause right here for a moment long enough to choose a response, which seems impossible to people. Uh, this is a quote from Viktor Frankl, who wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning. If you're not familiar with it, it's a good book to read. It was, it was published in 1946, right after the war. He was a psychiatrist in concentration camps. And uh, he observed and came up with lots of, uh, of um, ideas about people and the way people work. He had, this is one of his quotes. Between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. If he could figure that one out in a concentration camp, I think we can apply it somehow to sound of somebody chewing. The other aspect of interpersonal effectiveness that I want to mention is judgment. People with misophonia have a very well-developed thing. They call it a death glare. Somebody's chewing gum and they are glaring at them. Of course, the person they're glaring at has no idea why or even if they notice it. And the person who's glaring figures they're being rude and obnoxious because they're not responding to the glare. And if it's somebody in their family, they will yell at them or rudely comment. They also tend to be highly judgmental of others and other people's behavior. So I had a woman quite a long time ago who knew that it was very rude to slurp soup. She would she'd be eating and somebody on the other side of the restaurant was slurping soup. And she wanted to get up and go over there and knock the bowl out of their hand and yell at them, you know, didn't anybody teach you how to eat soup? This is so rude and disgusting and obnoxious and all those kinds of things. Then she went on a trip to Japan <laughs> where she discovered that everybody eats soup like that. And in fact, she was the one who was considered rude because she did not slurp, which meant she was insulting the chef. It shocked her to come to this and she realized that there was something wrong with her way of looking at things. And so when she came back, she decided that it was whatever she said, it's not my job to be the morality police. And she would begin to talk herself off of that edge. So I developed this um, sort of an illustration of how that works, I think. In the center of an onion, there's this core. That is the neurological reaction that people have to a sound. But there are all these layers on top of it. Judgment, a lot of shoulds, frustration, irritation, glaring, anger, can't stand it, fight, flight, things like that, are all on top of this. If you peel off these layers, you're still gonna end up, maybe for the rest of your life, I hate that sound. That sound disturbs me. But you don't have the burden of carrying around all these other layers on top of it if you peel them and get rid of them, it's a lot easier uh, to, to manage. And this, is, this diagram, this idea, has been very helpful to a lot of the people that I work with. So a couple of the quick examples of bottom-up uh, processing. Any kind of somatic psychotherapy that works with the body rather than with the mind, such as somatic experiencing, integrative body psychotherapy, hot homey, bioenergetics. Uh, this, EMDR, and tapping, I mentioned earlier, are excellent ways to begin to change things around coming from the bottom up, which is where those things are, not in the head. So uh, I have some other things that I do, I have many, many things that I do with people, and I think I'm going to stop at this point, though, and take uh, questions. So in conclusion, I find that CBT works very well with tinnitus, and to some degree with hyperacusis, 
but adding DBT and other bottom-up therapies, I believe, is much more effective with particular use of audio. And that collaboration between audiologists and psychotherapists makes the best of both fields. So that the sound part of it can be uh, offered through the audiologist and the uh, other parts of it that are the psychological, emotional parts of it can be offered through the psychotherapist. Thank you very much, Dr. Jaffe, for a fantastic presentation. And uh, uh, I just wanted to ask this. Uh, TBT has a lot of uh, evidence based for uh, helping people with suicidal ideations. And uh, as you're using this technique for patients with misophonia, do you, what is your evaluation on the proportion of people with misophonia who may actually have suicidal ideations? Well, I'm not the researcher, and I don't do data collection. I'm a solo practitioner, so I can't give you an actual number, but I can tell you that I hear that often. I'm, I, I have a little informal screening that I do when people first come to see me, and one of the questions is whether they have uh, thought about, uh, if they've had suicidal ideas on a scale of 1 to 10, and uh, most of them are 0 to 10. Most of them are 0, but there, there is a portion of low numbers and then every now and then a higher number and that's where I start with those people. We start with that and we look at what is the meaning of life and what do they want from get more existential about it.